some very important things to us. That account is found in Luke chapter 7, verses 36 through 50. I had in read 46 through 50, but we'll go back. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to follow along. And let's, let's read these verses together, beginning at verse 36. Luke 7. Then one of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. And he went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city, who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him, weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Notice in verse 40, the Lord here said, Simon, I have something to say to you. But as I mentioned a moment ago, Simon has something to say to us as the result of the Lord's encounter with him. And so this morning, I want you to notice three things Simon says to you and to me. First of all, Simon says, self-satisfaction is a sin. Self-satisfaction is sin. Simon was a Pharisee. And that word in itself means separate. Well, that's not a bad thing necessarily, is it? In fact, we as Christians are to be separate from the world and in terms of worldly things. Separation is not sinful, but the Pharisees took it too long. And they elevated themselves above others and they were self-satisfied, respectable, maintaining a form of religion, but with no spiritual progress whatsoever. When you look at the parable that Jesus gave in Luke 18 of the Pharisee and the publican, both of them went to the temple to pray, and the Pharisee simply reported to God, rather than praying to God, really. He reported to God about how good he was, about how he fasted, about how he gave tithes, etc., etc., all of this. The publican wouldn't even lift his eyes so much upward, but beat upon his chest and cried, God be merciful to me, a sinner. Now in that parable, Jesus said, who, who is it that went away justified that day? It was not that Pharisee. Why? Because he was self-satisfied. And Jesus in effect said, he did not go away justified because he was so self-satisfied. Therefore, self-satisfaction is sinful. It's sinful. It is sinful because it causes a person, in effect, to congratulate himself on how good he is and to be perfectly satisfied with being less than he should be. It was Will Rogers who said, I always like to hear a man talk about himself because then I'll hear nothing but good. 
generally a lot of truth in that. But here's the question. Why does the Lord condemn this attitude? Why does the Lord condemn this attitude? Because this attitude bars the way to penitence. Because there's no penitence, no repentance, where there's no recognition of sin. That Pharisee in the parable, the Pharisee and the publican, he had no recognition of sin whatsoever. Therefore, there was no penitence. All he did was just simply brag on himself to the Lord. And the attitude of self-righteousness, of self-satisfaction, prohibits recognition of sin. Therefore, better living is impossible for such a one. You are not ever going to grow with that kind of attitude. Well, what causes that attitude? What causes this, this kind of attitude? It's caused, really, many times by being content with a low standard. We're content. We're content with a low standard. I think I may have mentioned this illustration in another lesson, in another connection about the Missouri uh, state legislator. He was offered $25,000 by a particular lobbying group to vote, to vote a particular way on a bill. But then the other side approached him and offered him $50,000. So he took the $50,000 and gave the $25,000 back. And then he later turned state's evidence and when he did he was asked, well, why did you return the $25,000? He said, because I'm too conscientious to take money from both sides. <laughs> That's a low standard. <laughs> That's when you have a low standard. And when you have that low standard, you can justify meeting that standard and feel perfectly good about it. And that was the problem with the Pharisees. They generally judge themselves by their own Standard, And that's exactly what you're reading about here in the passage that we have read together about this Pharisee. We really don't know why or what motivated this Pharisee to invite Jesus to dine with him anyway. I mean, it could have just been mere curiosity, you know, where he said, I'd just really like to see a little bit more about what this man is about. But he obviously didn't have the right attitude in his dealings with the Lord, as did the sinful woman, and his attitude was not proper toward her. Obviously. So the Pharisees judged themselves by their own standard. Do members of the Lord's church ever have a tendency to do that? Well, yes. <laughs> what, about, what about setting our own standards as far as faithfulness and attendance is concerned? Yeah, that's, that's done sometimes, and so there are those you don't ever see on Sunday night some you don't ever see on Wednesday night. Why? Because they are satisfied with that standard of being Sunday morning only. Maybe just Sunday morning worship only, not even Bible class on Sunday morning. That's their standard they have set. What about giving? They have a standard concerning their money. They've set that standard and they're comfortable with that standard. Manner of worship, marriage, modesty even, in terms of clothing, you know. I mean, I'm sorry, but do you, I see some things, well, I don't see them. Janice does a lot of times and say, you can't look at this. <laughs> you know? And, you know, she said, you, I mean, you, 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 you should see this, but you should. <laughs> and who are they? Many times they're members of the Lord's Church who are posting things on Facebook, you know, in public ways, or commending certain activities where they have no business committing them. And they're comfortable obviously doing that. Why? Because that's the standard, apparently, that they've said. And they have determined that some preacher who preaches on modest apparel, that's that's the preacher's thing, apparently, but it doesn't apply to, to them necessarily. That shouldn't be the case. There is no higher standard than that which God sets for us as Christians. And we can know what those standards are in Scripture. We can. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect, Matthew 5, 48. In other words, that's the standard. That's the ultimate standard. Can we be sinless? No. Can we be 
faithful and, and blameless? Yes, we can. Let this mind be in you, Paul wrote in Philippians 2, 5, which was also in Christ Jesus. I think I mentioned perhaps before that Christians should have a healthy dissatisfaction. Is there such a thing as having a healthy dissatisfaction? Yes. I believe it belongs to the Christian. Should. A healthy dissatisfaction. What do I mean by that? What Paul meant when he wrote, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upper call of God in Christ Jesus. Philippians 3, 13 and 14. In other words, Paul had a healthy dissatisfaction. I'm not self-satisfied, he said. I'm still moving forward. I'm still growing. As Peter admonished in 2 Peter 3, 18, but grow in the grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And formalism can cause this attitude. In other words, just, just going through a formality in your religious practice, going through the motion, so to speak. Were the Pharisees guilty of that? Oh, were they ever guilty of that? Think about it cleaning the outside and being satisfied to clean the outside, but inwardly what? Yeah. Jesus made it very clear, especially in Matthew chapter 23, as he rebuked them time and time again. And also, something else that causes this attitude is neglect of self-examination. Because we should examine ourselves. How do I know that? Well, Paul just said we should in 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He said, examine yourselves as to whether or not you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless you are indeed disqualified? And then he went on to say, but I'm convinced you're not disqualified. Examine yourselves. That's what we are to do. So the first thing that Simon says to us is, Self-satisfaction is sin, and he was guilty of that kind of self-satisfaction. Because he could look at that woman and say, why? And think to himself, if this man knew, really knew her, if he were a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman this is, and he wouldn't even be giving her the time to do it. What an attitude. But the second thing Simon says in verse 39 is, see the soul of the sinner. See the soul of the sinner. But you see, what he saw was just the sin. Look at it. This man, he said, if he were a prophet, would know who and what matter of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. No. Yes, she's a sinner, but she is a sinner with a what? With a soul. With a spirit that will live forever. And Jesus saw the soul. He saw that soul. And he saw the soul of this sinful woman. In John 8, the woman taken in adultery, he saw her in the same way. He recognized the preciousness of those souls. John chapter 4, did he recognize the preciousness of the soul of that Samaritan woman at the well? Absolutely he did. Absolutely he did. And look where that led. Look at how many conversions that resulted in. Because he took time with a woman who was morally deficient, who was materialistic, she said, give me this water. He talked about living water, and he said, give me this water. So she said, give me this water so I don't have to come to the well and draw. And yet he was patient with her, and look at how that <coughs> played out. Yeah. Yes, indeed, we have to hate sin, obviously, but we have to love the soul of the sinner. <coughs> we can never condone sin. If we condone sin, then we really fail to show love for the sinner. If we condone sin. But Jesus said, because Jesus did say, as many as I love, I what? I excuse and overlook. No. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. And we can stimulate that same attitude. Simon here failed to make a very important distinction between the sinner and her sins. He did not make that distinction. He failed to see the intrinsic priceless value of her soul. So that's the second thing Simon says to us. See the soul of the sinner. 
third thing Simon says, and finally is, see yourself as forgiven, but not as faithful. See yourself as forgiven, but not faithful. That was his problem. He was favored. This woman, this woman, she was a ranked sinner. He was a Pharisee. He was favored. He did not view forgiveness like this sinful woman viewed forgiveness. Why? Because he didn't see sin the way she saw sin. And that's what Jesus pointed out. Have all sinned and come short of the glory of God? Absolutely. Romans 3, 23. All need forgiveness. But you know something? Our attitude towards sin will determine our attitude towards service. Gratitude prompts us to love much and to serve out of that love. And that's what we have with this sinful woman. There's no question about the fact that this woman left the presence of the Lord as a loving servant. As a loving Jesus told this woman in verse 50 of Luke 7, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Was it faith alone that saved her? No. No, it wasn't faith alone. Her actions, she was active. She showed her faith. She showed her love for the Lord. And the peace that comes from the knowledge of forgiveness is truly the peace that passes all understanding. Now, who can appreciate that? Only the forgiven in Christ can appreciate it. And only the forgiven in Christ can allow that to prompt them to a higher level of love and labor with every passing day. This simple woman came to know that kind of peace. I mean, was she, was she in turmoil? Yes, absolutely in turmoil. Weeping. Weeping. And perhaps realizing my tears are falling on the feet of Jesus, I need, I need to wipe those feet. And she did. But something else about the Pharisee, remember? As Jesus reminded the Pharisee of what he had not done, he hadn't even extended common courtesy to someone who was not the Lord Jesus Christ even. Go back to verse 44. Do you see this woman? Do you see this woman? That's a good sermon in itself. Do we see this woman? <laughs> we should. We should. But he said, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. Was it a common act of hospitality for the host to wash the feet or have a servant wash the feet of those who came in as guests? Absolutely. He had not done that. That may give us some insight into the attitude the Pharisee had towards Jesus in inviting him in the first place. And it may have been a mere curiosity rather than really being interested in what the Lord had to say. She has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. Was it customary to give a kiss, a greeting? Yes. He said, you gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. Was it customary at times to anoint the head of the Lord? Yes, this woman has done that. You didn't. You didn't. Therefore I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much. That's the key. Love active. Love active. I believe, and I've mentioned this probably before, that to me, the greatest summary in very succinct fashion anywhere in the New Testament about what the Christian life is all about is in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, where Paul wrote, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. There's the summary, I believe of the epitome of what the Christian life is to be for all of us. Faith, what? Faith, yes, but faith working, yes, has to be a working faith, but motivated by what? Faith working through love. And that's what we have right here in Luke chapter 7. 
You have faith working through love. You know it is because Jesus commended her faith and said she loved much. And he added, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. But in whose eyes is forgiveness a little thing? In the eyes of those like the Pharisee who don't appreciate the seriousness of sin to the fullest extent. Shouldn't we all be equally grateful for the forgiveness of sins that we have received if we have been forgiven, if we've obeyed the gospel, if we're in Christ, if we have been forgiven? doesn't matter what our sins were before that time. They were still sin, and they separated us from God. Therefore, we should all love much because we were all in sin before we obeyed the gospel, if we obeyed it. But the Pharisee didn't see it that way. Therefore, Simon says to us, see the soul of the sinner. Self-satisfaction will keep you from doing that. Therefore, you must see yourself as forgiven. And not Three things Simon says. Self-satisfaction is sinful, not just a mistake or a flaw, it's a sin. Seeing the soul of the sinner is crucial and seeing yourself as forgiven but not faithful and never losing sight of the forgiveness and the love that that knowledge of forgiveness should be both within our hearts and the kind of service that it should prompt us to do. And when we realize those things, like this sinful woman did, we may go in peace.